I am fortunate to be joined by the co-chairman of the executive steering group of the Future Vertical Lift Initiative. Um, Mr. Jose Gonzalez is the deputy director of the Land Warfare and Munitions uh, Directorate and the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. He's an engineer by training, okay. um, began as a software engineer and worked a number of different Navy programs, uh, joined the Office of Secretary of Defense um, about 13 years ago, I think, yep. um, and has worked on a whole bunch of different high priority initiatives in that capacity. Um, and as I mentioned, is, is co-leading the uh, executive steering group for FBL. His co-chair is um, Brigadier General Gary Thomas. He's the Deputy Director for Force Management Application and Support in the Joint Staff, the J-8. He is a um, career aviator and trainer uh, with both uh, command and instructor positions at, uh, to include at the Air Weapons and Tactics uh, Squadron. He was the commander of the 2nd Mon Afghanistan um, and a student of the Weapons and Tactics Instructor course um, and, and then again back there um, with Mott's. Uh, he's a graduate of the Air Command of Staff College and at, of the National War College, so maybe, a, so that, and, and has had uh, assignments previously in the Joint Staff on the J-5 and at Headquarters Marine Corps uh, Aviation, so uh, has, a, has a really broad uh, joint perspective on uh, both the operational and um, and uh, training and instructor elements of, of rotorcraft issues writ large. So uh, I, one of his able-bodied assistants in this effort <laughs> is uh, Colonel Kevin Christensen. He's the chief in the Force Support Division NJ-8. Um, he is responsible for the joint requirements for joint future vertical lift. He also has commanded at multiple levels uh, and, and to include the attack recon battalion uh, and an, an attack recon battalion in Iraq um, and was the brigade commander down at Fort Rucker responsible for aviation training for the Army. So again, um, a, a great team with lots of different experiences and perspectives. And so I will turn it over to you, Mr. Gonzalez, to okay. kick it off and we'll go down the line. Right. If I could just make a quick sure. few admin yep. remarks briefly. If you could turn off the ringers on your cell phones, we'd appreciate it. And we will be opening this up for uh, Q&A when we get through these remarks. Um, if people would like to tweet questions, they can do so to our security dialogues to at, to at CSIS SEC, S -E -C, dialogue, um, or you can email them to me at mlead, M-L-E-E-D, at CSIS dot O-R-G. So um, with those announcements, over Good. to you. All right, Dr. Lee, Myron, thank you very much for this opportunity, um, and, and to CSIS as well. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, some, some new faces, but also some very uh, good friends of mine uh, in the audience here. So thank you very much for, for coming out to this. This is uh, very important, uh, and uh, it's an honor to have this opportunity to come and, and share with you all uh, what the building DOD is thinking about in this future vertical lift initiative. It's very important. Um, as, as Dr. Lee mentioned, there's often some misconceptions about uh, some of the terminology. What we're doing here is very different uh, than, than how we've done a lot of historical and traditional programs. So it's very important to communicate um, our strategy and uh, what we've got going on uh, to, 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 to the entire community of which industry, uh, small business, academia, uh, our friends on the Hill, uh, and, 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 and everyone to really understand what we're doing. Um, I want to start by uh, saying uh, from within the Office of Land Warfare and Munitions, I oversee a variety of portfolios uh, from the munitions, ordnance side to uh, ground, uh, robotics, um, ground combat vehicles, tactical vehicles, and then there's aviation. And aviation was the newest to me when I, when I took, on, uh, took on board uh, this job. Um, and I'm not qualified at, at a lot of things, but one of the things that I feel like I'm qualified because of this broad portfolio, I'm able to do a compare and contrast uh, between what some communities have going for them that others don't. And uh, I apologize if I repeat myself, because I often talk about this when I, when I talk to this community, but if, if you bear with me here, I want to talk a little bit about what I see the 
rotary wing, vertical lift community, uh, its industry partners, its operators uh, have going for them that some of these other communities don't have. And it's a room, some, you know, some room for optimism as we step forward. The first one is uh, there's a long history in, in vertical lift and uh, aviation. It's a very mature community, uh, strong reputation for producing world-class aircraft. So I, I, I can go down the list uh, from the V-22s to the 53Ks to the Blackhawks to the Apaches, and I apologize if I leave any of your aircraft out, but, but we do have the world-class best uh, helicopters uh, in the world. Uh, best and most adapt adaptable operators and warfighters. Um, I have Colonel Allie Thompson out there, uh, uh, 53 Echo, and she tells me all the time how it is she had to operate uh, that, that aircraft. Helicopters are not easy. I'm a motorcycle uh, rider, so I'm used to hands-on stuff. That's the way helicopters are. You, got to, you actually have to work them. So we do have the, most, the best and most adaptable operators and warfighters that they take whatever aircraft we give them and they, they make it work. Um, we will always have an enduring operational mission need for, for road ruling, and, and I'll certainly defer to, to the general on that because he's, he's a real true warfighter. But I believe in, in a lot of the missions that we see ourselves doing, we will always need uh, the capability that the vertical lift brings to us. Um, a record of steady and healthy funding, and, and I can you know, speak certainly the, the Army's had, had a, a large a budget in this area, a lot of production dollars. Um, uh, through the years, so, so we've, we've benefited from that. Uh, we've got leadership attention uh, on Rotary Wing to include our, our, con our congressional members. Um, we've got a vision, a strategy, and plan. We have a DEPSEC-DEF approved uh, strategic plan. There's, there's not a lot of communities that I can say that have that, and we do have that, and it's in black and white uh, written down. And, and I'm a, that's the, I want to share a little bit more about what that strategy talks about. We have government and industry working together. Some of you all are part of the Vertical Lift Consortium. Um, that's an opportunity where we've been able to share um, our strategies and get insights from industry, academia, small business through the formal Section 845 OTA agreement that we have with the Vertical Lift Consortium. That's a, a huge plus. Um, we've got the services working together, supported by OSD and joint staff. So uh, Dr. Lee mentioned this executive steering group. Um, that's, it doesn't end there. We've got Council of Colonels, we've got IPTs. We have a full structure of joint military services uh, working together up front in, in, in this Future Vertical Lift Initiative. We have a very hungry industry, uh, very competitive industry, active. Um, you're self-investing, and you're pushing innovation, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, we have an active S&T component that's feeding uh, the, the future of future vertical lift, which you all know is a joint multi, the Army's joint multi-role S&T project. Um, so we've got a very vibrant, uh, ongoing initiative that's helping uh, develop technologies that will help feed future uh, FVL programs. And then we've got, um, in, 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 in the area of, of, of Rotary Wing, we've got commercial and military markets, which really helps our, our DOD um, vendors because you can, you can leverage uh, the commercial markets that we have in, in Rotary Wing. So um, that's probably more time than I know Dr. Lee wanted to give me on that, but let me just, let me just talk a little bit about why and, and what FVL is, if I can. Um, a lot of the whys, why we need to have a future vertical lift initiative um, we've got an accelerated and aging um, uh, force due to the, uh, of, of helicopters due to the op tempo. Uh, uh, regrettably, we've, we've had a significant amount of vertical lift losses, both in lives and aircraft. Uh, we've got escalating uh, operational sustainment cost. Uh, we've got a set of uh, documented capability gaps from a 2008 uh, CBA. Um, we see as the aircraft that we're producing today, we see a sunsetting of those um, aircraft. We see that we have some, um, some concern in, in the area of industrial base and, and, and what comes next after we finish buying the helicopters that we're planning to buy. Uh, we do know that we have a significant development uh, lead time 
uh, for, for something as, as major as a helicopter. And then obviously we've got the challenges that the budget environment provides us. So that, that's all, the, all of the reasons, and there's many, many more, for, for why we needed to have a future vertical lift uh, initiative. Now, Colonel Thompson helped me here. There was, a, um, there was an ADM acquisition decision memorandum signed out by Ash Carter back in uh, 2009, which really started uh, the Future Vertical Lift Initiative. And um, that got the services, that, that allowed us to engage and, and start up the consortium, but it also got us working together as a community uh, driven towards how do we meet some of those challenges that I talked about. So there's six elements uh, as I bubble them up. And, and, and Dr. Lee, I'm gonna actually give you a, a card. So a lot of you all see that I've got this little fancy little card. I don't have cards for everyone. Um, <laughs> But um, when I first took on the job, there was this huge strategic plan that was about this big. <laughs> and I asked my folks, look, how, how do I communicate what this big document says? What, what are the big nuggets here? What, what is our strategy? And, and, and I'll go through them very quickly. And as, we, as I address questions, I'm gonna frame it. And in fact, we run the ESG. What we do is we go through each of the six elements and we talk about what are we doing in each of these areas and how are we progressing the state of the art in each of those areas. The first one is a decision point based plan of execution and that's simply a roadmap. We understand uh, all of our aircraft ac across all of the services. We understand what aircraft we have today and we clearly understand that they have a finite life. Um, we do like to stretch that life um, but they do have a life and, and, and clearly understanding that if, if the life of that aircraft ends here and we have a development cycle to either modify or, 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 or start a new year, we do know we have finite time to, to start something. So it's a very deliberate, um, uh, very focused uh, effort to understand kind of where all of our helicopters are across all of the, the services. The second one is early joint requirements development and, and the general and, and Colonel Christian said, uh, lead that for us. But we've upfront deliberately are ensuring that the multi-service requirements are being viewed from a joint perspective. And we're spending a lot of time early on to get those requirements uh, right. And that's, those are requirements that will feed future uh, military programs in the area of rotary wing. The second one is that, the, I'm sorry, the third is the s and plan that aligns technology development with milestone decision options. Again, in order for the decision makers to be able to uh, have clear decisions to make, we need to be maturing the, techno the critical technologies in the right area. In the case of, of uh, JMR, JMR is doing that. Joint multi-role is, is advancing technology and that technology is, is being matured to help feed uh, future vertical lift. The fourth one, we knew early on we weren't gonna just build one helicopter that would do everything for every mission that would satisfy all sizes and, uh, and all missions. So we're envisioning a, front, a multi role family of aircraft. Those could be by weight class. We've talked about light, medium, heavy, ultra heavy. We've talked about mission types. So we're still formulating um, how we will structure, but we do know we will have multiple aircraft. Um, the fifth, which is very important to us, is common systems and open architecture. You're gonna hear a lot from us in terms of commonality, how important it is, um, not just from a logistics standpoint, but how important it is for us to build commonality uh, between those multi-role uh, uh, family of aircraft. And the last, um, uh, definitely last but not least, is, is having industry engage with the government and DOD from the start. And again, that's afforded to us through the Vertical Lift Consortia, uh, but having you all as, as partners with us up front is, is extremely key to our future Vertical Lift uh, strategy. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and then Dr. Lee, I'm probably gonna turn it over to the general. general. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Just a, just a few <laughs> thoughts from, a, from the joint warfighter perspective. Um, the first thing that I would say uh, that makes me enthusiastic about future vertical lift in terms of an approach is the whole notion of interoperability. As you look across the joint force, and I, you know, you got many former and current, you know, operators in the audience, you know, I think we're better than we've ever been. Uh, however, uh, there are still some gaps there. 
when we tend to think of solutions, we tend to think of a platform. Uh, but I would argue that in, in the area of interoperability, particularly, for example, digital interoperability, I think that we've still got a lot of room uh, for growth. Uh, I can think of several recent experiences where we've got uh, tremendous capabilities from different services who are working together on the battlefield, uh, but because they can't share that information, because you know one particular system doesn't talk to the other one because they weren't made by the same uh, OEM, uh, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that we are not able to push out to the force because of those stovepipes. Future vertical lift as an approach gives us an opportunity to uh, move the ball further down the field across this family of, of aircraft, or family of systems, rather. The other point that I would make, and it's related, but it's also got the, the programmatic piece, and, and Mr. Gonzalez has already touched on it, and that is the ability to you know, define requirements you know, earlier in, in the process. And this has been kind of a long-standing you know, goal, not just in FEO, but in other programs. And I think uh, it's been, we've had, you know, you know, various levels of success uh, doing that. But uh, when you're looking at a family of systems or a portfolio, and you do get the requirements right, you are going to uh, create a, a, a capability that's much greater than the sum of its parts. Again, I go back to the you know, area of digital interoperability from an operational standpoint. <coughs> From a programmatic standpoint, as many of you all know, and my experience has shown me, is that you know, um, the earlier that you get the requirements scoped, you know, it, it's going to give you a better a chance of success in terms of executing that program. One of my own experiences where you know, initially we didn't get it right, but subsequently did, was presidential you know, helicopter. And you know, uh, requirements uh, just kept you know, moving everything uh, to the right. The cost uh, went up, uh, schedule moved to the right, and eventually the program, as you all know, became you know, unaffordable. Uh, again, you know, as an advocate for this particular approach across a family of systems, I think you know, it has the potential to provide a lot of value not just to the individual services, the individual customers, but uh, to DOD as, as a whole. Okay. Carl well, thanks for having me here. I, I, I feel very passionately about uh, future vertical lift and the effort. Uh, today, as the Joint Warrior Fighting Force, we really do have the world's best fleet uh, of aircraft. But we shouldn't be content with that. We really can do better. You know, if you look at what we have today, uh, we have a fleet that has uh, proven its success uh, from Desert Storm to present. But that same fleet uh, consists of around 25 separate Mission Design Series aircraft, uh, over 6,000, about 6,600 aircraft across uh, OSD. And when we go to support that joint warfighter, we haul 23 separate or so uh, systems to a theater, each with its own separate line of uh, supply and we're not nearly as interoperable as we could be. So as we look towards the future, uh, there are capability gaps. We should be able to, to go faster. We should be able to go further. But some of the biggest areas where <coughs> we can do uh, the most good for the joint warfighter may not necessarily be in the air vehicle itself. The gains that we can have in commonality, and not just in a physical context, but commonality in terms of system, common architecture, training, maintenance, sustainment. You know, where we go in the future, it's not that our current fleet of airplanes are gonna fall out of the sky. Uh, we, we will continue to incrementally upgrade. ...community to make a very capable, more capable platform, reduce our O&M costs reduce our losses that we've experienced uh, due to mishaps. We lose too many aircraft to mishaps. Uh, 
And the next uh, fleet of aircraft should be able to operate in a degraded visual environment and bring that capability to the joint warfighter. As an Army aviator, I'm very thankful for the leaders that came before me who, in similar budget environment and tough trying times coming out of the Vietnam conflict, they saw and had the vision that there was additional capability that could be achieved and they had the vision and the leadership fortitude to make the current uh, fleet of aircraft that are, form the backbone of our fleet. And I think that same leadership is required in our time. We have to look out towards the 2030 and beyond time frame and see what that joint warfighter has to have. And you know, we are wrestling with the requirements. Uh, we'd like to you know, have lots of ands. Ands are go fast and go far and go high and hot, uh, but there are many cases where there's gonna be oars. And as we look towards making this aircraft, it's gonna be affordable, and it's going to have a, a reduced operating cost, or we certainly won't be able to afford it. There's great opportunity for us to be able to do that, and as Mr. Gonzalez and General Thomas have identified, you know, so much of our effort is pre-MDD uh, analysis to figure out and really lock down what do we have to have the more stable we can do that, uh, the family of systems and, and programs that follow from it, we're going to achieve that interoperability and, the, and those uh, cost savings that I think will make uh, FVL truly a, a great uh, family of systems portfolio approach to vertical lift that we just have not done in the past. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, all of you, for that overview. Um, let me kick it off with a couple of questions and then we'll okay. open it up to everyone here and, and out in the web world. Um, so you mentioned the, the strategic plan and the, um, and the senior level commitment. I, I think one of the ways that commitment is manifest always is in budgets. Um, some have pointed out that funding for FEL is both a little bit in the future and relatively small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, in your collective judgment, um, is it adequate? What are the implications of the budget environment for FBL in particular? And, and is the sort of scale and scope of the effort an advantage or a disadvantage in that context? Would you like me to start? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure. glad to jump in first. So we, we obviously, uh, you all have watched how um, the start of at least the first uh, program has moved a little bit to the right uh, over the years. Uh, we, had, we had hoped to had started um, more of a programmatic effort a little earlier, but, but as you mentioned, <coughs> Dr. Lead, um, the, the budget environment is, is very difficult. Uh, we find ourselves um, having to make trades. The services find themselves having to make uh, very difficult uh, decisions uh, in the creation of their budgets. Um, one thing we need to keep in mind, a, a lot of the future vertical lift work, the analysis work that we're doing, the technology work that we're doing is could feed alternatives other than a new start program. They could inform uh, a major upgrade or, or a, it could be a con ops change. Um, so I think what we're delivering uh, with very few resources, and, and, and the leadership commitment is, um, is, is a lot of leadership commitment from the services. The IPTs uh, that the colonel leads, uh, there's a fair amount of people that are engaged in, in the development of, of e be it con ops, requirements, acquisition strategies. There's a fair amount of, even though it's not programmatic dollars, there's a fair amount of commitment in terms of people resources work in this. But a lot of the work that's coming out of that is helping, uh, to, inf is helping to provide the decision makers, uh, which is, is not me, by the way, um, providing them with technological options, uh, analytical uh, foundations, good strategies. But it, it is going to, at the end of the day, to start a, a new start program, it's going to require uh, the services having to, to come up with, with dollars that are going to come at the expense of something else. Uh, the large scope, um, I think the large scope is an advantage because we're leveraging uh, each other. So no service is going at this alone. Uh, the Navy can leverage the Army's S&T. The uh, Army can uh, leverage the Navy's um, 
understanding of open systems architecture. So I think the broad scope, us taking on a broad scope initiative, I think is an advantage uh, to us, uh, vice a disadvantage. And then again, the resources, we'd, we'd like there to be uh, more resources to this, certainly, but but and you're but not unique in that regard. Yeah, we're not unique, um, and again, that is that is a service uh, decision that uh, they have to make those trades. So uh, yeah, uh, I would I would I would just piggyback onto those comments. I mean, and, and you, you allude to it, Dr. Lee. I mean, this is not about this particular approach per se. I mean, the the fiscal constraints that we face are, uh, across the department are going to make things challenging over the next you know, foreseeable uh, future. From my perspective, though, just looking back over uh, decades is, you know, it's not a matter of you know, if, it's a matter of when. That is, a lot of the work that, that will be done uh, will inform a broad range of activities that Mr. Gonzalez has already uh, highlighted. And then if you look at our current you know, force, there are options that we've got to you know, you can you know, sustain life longer. But the point that I would make is, uh, and, and I think everyone in the audience understands this, eventually you get to a point of diminishing, you know, returns. So, you know, sustaining life of your current um, force becomes more expensive. And so it's, um, from my perspective, are we getting the approach right you know the demand signal is going to be is is going to be out there. We may argue about where exactly it's going to fall, but we know uh, it's coming. And vertical lift is a large portion of the department's capability, and it's something that's going to have to be addressed. I think when we look at a family systems approach, we realize that we're not going to take the entire family of systems to a material uh, development decision all at the same time. We'll, there'll be pieces of it, and it's prioritized based off of you know, who's first to need and what things we think we're ready to bring. But also, I think uh, part of the cost is we look at, you know, there's the procurement cost of, of a new uh, helicopter, but the real value may be in looking at how we affect downstream the O&M cost. So the co total cost of ownership of this family of systems may be much more manageable because we're taking a family systems approach. Uh, you know, if you, even if you had a modest 5% uh, decrease in your total O&M cost, when you look at that across the life cycle of all those systems, that's, that's measured in hundreds of billions of dollars worth of savings. So I think it, it's never going to be inexpensive to, to design and procure a new system, but I think the way we're doing it is the way that will give us the best return on investment. Well, let me um, open it up for questions. Um, I think we've got a couple in the front up here. Yeah. Start with you and then sit and think. And Jen, you can go first this time. <laughs> she never gets to go first. Hi, Jen Judson with Inside the Army. Um, bouncing off your question, uh, I think we're looking at potentially seeing full sequestration again in FY16 and, and then beyond. So I'm wondering what you're doing to protect things like the JMR development. Um, in the future, um, what that may look like if you're looking at a tighter budget, um, if you'll have to scale back or maybe look at more cost sharing options. Um, and then another quick question regarding training, maintenance, sustainment um, in the future. Um, will there be a phase where you hone in and really look at that? Like we're looking at an air vehicle, we're looking at mission systems. Will there be a phase where you do that? I'll take the, the second part first because yes, I mean, you can't just look at the aircraft um, and uh, the mission systems as a separate entity. And when we look at JMR, there's a phase one and a phase two to JMR, phase one being uh, focused on the air vehicle part. But phase two is equally important, and that's looking at the common mission architecture. Uh, you know, each service is going to have to make tough decisions about how much money they're able to uh, put against uh, this effort. Uh, but uh, by the time uh, we are at the point where serious money has to be put against uh, FBL. Uh, I think we'll be able, to, most of the services will be in a position where they'll be uh, less uh, focused on the, the close in and be able to look out a little bit further. Well, I should also note that we are also planning to have a specific JMR event on the 1st of July, so put that on your calendars. Um, and, and, and again, we will have additional follow on 
sessions about about all of these things as well, but that one's already on the calendar. So. I would like to add, if I could, Jen, to the first part of that, and that's certainly a question you should ask uh, the Army uh, during uh, that part uh, relative to the joint multi-role program, but the sense that I've got is that there's, uh, they're doing everything they can to protect those S&T dollars. Uh, certainly, the, you know, when we get the service POMs, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see it or we won't see it, but I have a sense that they're gonna try to protect uh, to the extent that they can. The, the technology piece of that, which is JMR. Yeah. Thank you. Sydney Friedberg, BreakingDefense.com. Uh, you know, looking at, for, well, recent and less recent history, we have in the Army a succession of helicopter programs that went, well, they flew, but they didn't actually go into production. Uh, and then we hear, uh, you know, conversely, you know, the, the model we have for a big joint multi-service program is F-35, which has also been somewhat painful. Uh, now, I don't think, when you say family, you don't mean something that's, you know, like an F-35A, B, C, where they're visually similar, even if they're massively different, you know, in the engines, but, you know, how do you avoid the pitfalls of both the Army-specific and the sort of overambitious tri-service programs of the past. And when you say a family, how much flexibility do you have in there before you lose the commonality that was the point in the first place? Kevin, you wanna hit that or General? <laughs> I, I think it's a great question. I mean, those, those are the kinds of uh, conversations that you have, um, uh, you know, throughout. You know, one thing I would, you know, say about the you talk about JSF, for example, and the, the, the challenges associated you know, with that. You know, I would argue, um, of course, I'll, I'll just say up front, my background is, is TAC Air. Um, but I, I think that there, there are going to be bumps along the road, and it is painful. It's just kind of the nature of what we do. And I think that there are a lot of lessons learned in, in terms of that program and mistakes that were made that we could capture in terms of an approach. Um, my opinion is, is that the taxpayer is gonna feel in the end like we made a good uh, investment on that <coughs> particular program. On, on the, the, the second part of your question, what's the balance between having you know, this, this family of systems and where's the tipping point where, you know, um, you don't have the, the type of commonality. We don't know where that is. Um, but one thing I would emphasize is, you know, we, and, and this isn't just FBL, I would just say this for any capability, we tend to think in terms of platforms. And that's an important part of it. But we need to think, it, uh, what I would argue is, as we have this discussion, we need to think about both the platform and the, the mission uh, systems. And uh, again, I, I would also argue that it's, it's a different, perhaps, uh, view than what we've taken uh, uh, on vertical lift writ large in the past. And that is, you know, it's, it's a helicopter, you know, and this is what it does. Um, there's so much more across this family of systems. I'm, I'm going from a mission system interoperability standpoint that I would argue is where your greatest return on investment you know, might be, in addition to the additional capabilities, speed, lift, uh, et cetera. To follow on to that, um, all of the services to varying degrees are, um, are pursuing man-on-man -man teaming approaches that are changing how they're utilizing rotorcraft. And many of those developments have come since the publication of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, have you, have you re-looked the strategic plan in that context? Does it need to be updated to reflect that evolution? How do you keep those two things moving forward consistently, um, given that they're not, you, you only own a part of that? So the strategic plan is a living document. We, we update it uh, annually. But when you think about uh, how, how it stays relevant and how we answer you know, the questions of man-to-man -man teaming, uh, all those things, and we're going to continue to have 
uh, a lot of discussion on requirements uh, to include things like uh, should it be optionally manned, uh, the degree with which all the variants need to have manned and unmanned teaming requirements. You know, certainly uh, we've, we've seen the value uh, in the warfight of uh, unmanned systems, and I think their integration with uh, what we do in future vertical lift, I, I see that as being more, mm -hmm. in, certainly increasingly important. If I could just tag on to that very briefly, a, a, an opportunity that this approach allows you to do. It allows you to capture, I would argue, the great work that the services are doing individually <coughs> and, and to a degree act as an integrating function you know, to get it uh, across the whole joint force and not just within you know, one, one service. One thing I'd like to just mention though, back specifically to your question. Unlike JSF, where we're talking a program to do multiple variants of, a, of an airplane, FDL may be several programs uh, of, of record. Uh, and not, you know, we're not already having envisioned you know, a particular one airplane that's going to do, uh, to do everything. I don't think that that's uh, a reason. So you may look at a family of things, and from the outside, there may not be any resemblance, but, you, you, but in terms of engines, in terms of Digital yeah. architecture, there may be a lot going on inside that's the same. Absolutely. There should be, you know, laws of physics still apply, so the bigger one's going to have a bigger engine and the smaller one's going to have a smaller engine. But the power would be is that that uh, service member who does the work on that knows how to pull the engine and it comes out in and out the same way on the big one as it does the small one. And that when we do avionics work, the uh, Avionics architecture ought to be plug and play so that uh, if an Army airplane's at a Marine Corps facility and the radio or nav system needs to be swapped out, we can do that and we can get that interoperability. Today, we certainly don't have that uh, capability. Could you retrofit that to the existing fleet or some of that existing fleet? There's lots of things that you can do, but you know, at some point, the, uh, the cost of the incremental upgrades it, you, know, you can applique a lot of things onto your legacy system platforms, but at some point, uh, the age-old problem of the airplane gets too big, it gets too heavy when everything that you continue to want to add in terms of capability is, is an afterthought. You know, we want to have this capability, we add it on before you long. Now you've got to go back and redesign and buy back the power margin uh, that you gave up. So when you think about what capability you want to have, if you know from the very beginning that interoperability and a uh, common architecture. I'd be able to get into the attack variant and a submarine warfare variant or uh, any other variant, and I ought to be able to see a common system architecture. It doesn't have to have the exact same layout necessarily, but certainly uh, there's a lot more that can be done in that area. And if you do that from the very beginning, I think there's a huge payoff down the road. Go in the back and then over here. Mr. Gomez, this is uh, Tony Capasio with Bloomberg News. I had a specific systems question. Where does the combat, re combat rescue helicopter fit in the overall flight plan that you're talking about? And the Air Force in March said that they were moving forward with a June award to Sikorsky of the plane. From where your shop sits in Cape and ATNL, is the plan, is the award on track this month or is there reconsideration because of sequestration concerns? Yeah, I, and Tony, I, I cannot address that. That's that, that's all pre-decisional at this point. Um, so I cannot address that at this point. Oh, where the helicopter fits in the overall plan. Yeah. So so as you mentioned, as I mentioned, the element one of the strate strategic plan, it, it it does look at all of our helicopter assets, Army, Air Force, Navy. So clearly, we recognize that there's a mission there uh, that the Air Force has, and we recognize the state of their current helicopters, and we know we have to make some decisions. It's either you know a new one, retrofit the existing one, so it fits within our overall uh, portfolio look uh, at vertical lift. But no, I, I, I cannot answer the question mm -hmm. relative to specific decisions on combat rescue helicopter. Okay. We've got one back here and then over here. That's okay. Oh, oh, it's part, wait, we need, we, can you use the mic for oh, okay. the recording? I won't talk too loud. <laughs> General Thomas, good to see you again. Good to see you. Doug, Doug Morrison from DuPont, and uh, had somebody asked me, you know, what, what does DuPont provide to helicopters? A lot of material. Mm -hmm. But that's where the discussion has been. I'd like to take it away from that. Uh, so any of the panel members, 
uh, maybe non-material solutions, roles and missions. Um, I saw one on my time on active duty looking at common airframes like the 60, mm -hmm. which both Special Ops, Air Force, Navy, Army had. But is this a roles and missions potentially? You know, it would seem that the days of separate fleets and multiple, 23 I think was the number that was mentioned, 23 different platforms, it would almost seem like that can't be afforded anymore. S so are there non-material solutions that we're looking at in terms of operational concepts, in terms of roles and missions, i.e. what services are responsible for, and again, General Thomas, I'd pick you out, does the Marine Corps need you know, three rotary wing aircraft plus the V-22 kind of thing. And, and I'm not picking a fight on that. Sure. I'm just saying that's kind of the tone of the discussion. I guess I would Thank answer you. it this way. You know, from, from an affordability standpoint, for all the reasons that uh, Mr. Gonzalez and Colonel Christensen have already uh, art articulated, I mean, there's value in, you know, that, that, that common approach. But to get to your question, I think that if you're successful in terms of achieving much greater commonality in the material solution, then that informs a, the, the broader question about how we use our force. Because what you are doing by increasing that commonality, you're increasing the flexibility of the joint force. So that a mission that was previously only done by one particular service could be done, perhaps, by another service, and then and that raises other questions. In the end, however, I think it, you know, it's it's value because you've increased the overall capability and capacity. You may not have increased the total numbers, but de facto you've increased your capacity because each of those uh, individual platforms are, are are more can do more missions. Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazine. This is kind of a merged question. Uh, when we're talking about commonality, there, there is in different services during different missions, the Army wants to is trying to move into some of the Navy things, operate from ships. We've had problems in the past. You need to, uh, you know, there's operating in the sea environment, salt water, you know, damages your ships. You know, are, are you going to maintain the separate uh, material condition between naval, naval helicopters and, and Army helicopters? Another one, you know, speed is obviously one of the speed range, one of your big capabilities. You know, there's, there's programs out there to do high speed um, helicopters with, with rotors and, and, and push propellers. And you've got a uh, tilt rotor concept. Are, are the, all those in, in the factor? And then basically I'm saying we lose helicopters all the time landing in brownout or whiteout conditions. Is that part of the program to try to avoid that? Well, I, th I think when we look at how the commonality is going to work, all the discussions, and, you know, being able to sit down uh, at a table where we're working requirements, and I have uh, folks working hard, uh, Army and uh, Navy together. You know, the Army uh, is looking to have uh, their variant is being marinized, uh, desire to have uh, DDG compatible uh, airframes, uh, while at the same time, you know, we recognize that, you know. We, we need to have uh, those common discussions. You know, it's not like as if uh, an Army aircraft hasn't been on a carrier or something like that before. And, and instead of having those uh, joint interoperability problems sorted out on the deck, uh, we can sort that out by working together uh, way upstream uh, with the requirements. You talked about the different you know, kind of variants where we've got you know, tilt rotor, new, uh, new technologies that provide you know, additional speed. Again. Uh, all that will, you know, inform, you know, the process going forward, and the, you know, the, the technical demonstration will, I think, be very helpful. But again, what I would encourage us all to do, as you know, uh, we begin to collect data from the, the technical demonstration and so forth, is think about the capabilities. Don't go, I want this kind of, you know, platform that does this. Think about the capability first. And then we'll find the best combination of you know, 
mission systems, uh, rotors, drive, drive trains, et cetera, uh, that we need. So the first question we always need to ask is not, not what type of rotorcraft or, or tilt rotor, it's what, what are the capabilities? And I, and I would say, and I don't want to be Pollyannish, you know, you talk about commonality. You know, there are, are areas where we won't, you know, be in, entirely common. But if you can, you know, uh, to the maximum extent pro uh, possible, come up with a common baseline that you can add on, you know, that's scalable. Again, these are all attributes that, and in some cases, will be achieved, not in every case. Um, let me ask a question about, I, I believe the report, the, the strategic uh, plan uses the word stagnant when referring to the rotorcraft industrial base, and there's been a lot of analysis showing the pace of innovation and relative to uh, fixed wing, and that it, it is, um, and that, and some people argue there are larger national implications for that and worry about uh, the loss of capacity domestically relative to the Europeans, for example, or um, how much of, uh, how, does the Defense Department have a, a broad view of how important this industry is to us nationally? Um, and so, and, and the, the practical impl uh, uh, implication of my question is, is DOD industrial policy, do they care about this program? Are they involved in it? Do they, um, should they be? I mean, what, what's, how, how does that interface work? Yeah, so let me, let me uh, jump in. Um, so ATNL has uh, chartered uh, MIBP, Manufacturing and Industrial Base Policy, to look at, specifically look at uh, the rotorcraft industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's ongoing right now okay. as we speak. So. Okay. That's clearly driven by the concern that you highlight. Um, we certainly recognize the aircraft that we have, and, and, and that, again, that, that concern for that sunset, uh, we have a strong concern mm. for the industrial base okay. uh, and rotorcraft. And uh, depending on the results of that, uh, we'll have to weigh options of what we can do uh, to help mitigate, because it's, it's an important uh, part of our defense uh, military um, capability. So we have to we have to do everything we can to to preserve it. Okay. Yeah. Two questions here. Well, go wait. I think I saw that hand first in the back on the on the end, and then we'll come up here. Slow. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell though because uh, behind. Frank Black, Modus wrote a fan. How soon do you think that the next 20, 30, 40 years? I've been at this for 35 years since Mr. Mark over here run Jart at the Pentagon, and it's still at the same place. Were you asking if we've cured all the ills in the Pentagon? And will we do that? <laughs> the answer is no. But where's this? I don't know how to say this. I don't. How when are we going to take some action and uh, <laughs> really resolve some of the things that we've talked about for all these years? So I would say, um, you know, there are challenges and, and, and certainly failures along the way. I would argue that if you look across the last 30, 40 years, as, you know, um, dysfunctional as some may say that, that we are, you know, writ large, the, the government industry team, but you look at what the government industry team has produced, maybe not at the exact time that we had originally hoped, but if you look at the joint force today, even after 12 years of war, I'll tell you it's the best in the world, it's best, it's better than it's you know, ever been. So, uh, you know, in terms of justif justifying my optimism, I would say that I am optimistic. I'm not always optimistic that you know, we'll get it on the timelines that, you know, that everyone may have desired. Uh, but uh, we, we tend to be going, I think, ultimately in, in the right direction. And I would add, I mean, while it's not uh, producing, uh, while we're not starting new programs, the work that we are doing right now in the technology area, in the analysis work, and the upfront requirements that are way far left of material development decision, as the general mentioned earlier, hopefully that will 
put us in a much better position that when this, any of the services or the services collectively uh, have uh, resources to put to it, we can hopefully have a more successful program. I think it's very valuable work that we're doing right now. We can't take counsel of our fears in everything that we do. We have to understand that there's going to be risk in a new development, and sometimes those efforts won't uh, pan out. But in the end, uh, if, if you look at what we have produced, uh, we, we do produce uh, the world's best systems, and they've proven themselves in combat, and that's the ultimate test uh, when it's in the hands of the warfighter. And so I think that uh, whereas our system is always uh, being tweaked in terms of how we manage requirements and how we manage acquisition, and even more challenging, how we manage money, the system has worked in the past, and we do produce uh, the world's best systems. Randy Rody from the Boeing Company, and good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks for investing your time to come out here and listen to us ask you questions. Uh, and, and mine has to do with the potential uh, or possibly conflicting messages and that impact on industry investment. So we're very aware of Department of Defense and the difficult choices that we're facing in terms of especially budgetary, which programs are the highest priority and get the funding, which of those areas we can accept risk. As you might expect, the same thing happens on industry side when they're looking at which, especially IR&D, which uh, areas do they invest in, which other areas do they decide not to pursue. So when it comes to a program like Future Vertical Lift, on the one hand, you hear messages of how important it is and high priority. Your investment of time here, panels, press, uh, like you talked about, ESG, OIPTs. So you get the message that it's a very high priority. And then on the other hand, we hear or see things about MDD slipping to the right, AOA slipping to the right, um, you know, nothing in the budget documents that reflects FVL. So if you were in that boardroom, what would you say to those executives in terms of how do you rectify those potentially conflicting messages? Well, um, you're not allowed to ask those kind of questions. You've been part of this uh, in the past. Um, uh, you know, you should tell us what they're saying in the boardroom. Yeah, I've never been on that side, but uh, clearly we are doing everything we can to be as transparent as we can with you guys. Um, you know, I, I, my door is always open to, to my industry partners. Um, I, I really can't tell you what, you know, on your side, I, I, I'd give them the, the, the facts and the truth as, as, as we're giving them to you. Um, yeah, this is a very difficult budget environment and there's a lot of competing requirements and it's not just on the material side there's there's competition for for troops versus material um you, you just got to give them the, the the facts as we're passing on passing them on to you because we're trying to be as transparent as we can uh within atnl and uh, within joint staff we're, we're trying our best not to hold back any any secrets from you all because we we understand that this is a community this is this is a team and it's uh, DOD and industry and, and all the other players working together, and we can't do it without you. But I'll defer to these guys. They're smarter than well, I am. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure I would presume to, you know, know what that conversation would be like in, inside the boardroom. But uh, from my perspective, I would say it might be a discussion of time, you know, and, and what, what's the horizon and, and where can we play, you know, and how much wiggle room do we have, how much margin, you know, can we invest it? You know, but, but I will point out, you know, we, you do have real money in the, the, the technical demonstration. You do have senior leaders within OSD and the joint staff, you know, participating, you know, in this process. And, I, and again, I'll just go back to my, you know, original points. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's, it, it's when. And I, and I realize that, you know, when you're dealing with the bottom line, that's not a particularly helpful uh, answer, uh, but, but it is where, is so we would you know presumably would turn to the industry team and go you know what what can you do you know given uh, the uh, constrained environment that, w that we're in well I I actually I got a question by email but um, but but it is now 1 30 so I feel obligated to let you off the hook unless you're willing to indulge one last question I'm good. Um, which is about uh, how the commonality, as it's, a, it's a, I think, n not as hard as the last one. Okay. <laughs> um, how, uh, how the commonality aspects of the program relate to the combined environment. So 
how, do, how does joint or combined interoperability play into uh, FEL, the FEL effort? Can I ask you to just share the example that you uh, shared with me earlier about your experience in Iraq working with the Marines? Well, you know, I, as a battalion commander in Iraq, I supported uh, the Marines in the MNF West uh, sector with Apaches, you know, and, and I, as I would operate in their area, our uh, desire to be as joint as possible was limited by some of the capabilities of our, of our systems, both in the maintenance uh, side uh, and also in our uh, C4 ISR side. Uh, likewise, when a Marine aircraft is, was uh, would land and break at my area, you know, the best I could do was uh, give them meals and a cot, and that was that was the extent of the joint support that they were getting out, out of me. And we can do a lot better. One of our four IPTs, in fact, probably one of our most important IPTs, is on commonality and, and looking at how does the commonality uh, impact our uh, how we're going to fight. And one of the things that we have done, I think that's a, a very important effort, is that we have uh, staffed through a, a, a what we call developmental conops and really asking the question, how does vertical lift fight in 2030 and beyond as a joint war fighting force? And all the services have actively participated and we've come to consensus. Now we have documents that help us understand better where how what areas of commonality are most important to the joint warfighter. And as we develop those requirements, you know, it also helps us identify more realistic threshold values. Uh, and that is going to, I think, be a very important part of our uh, requirements analysis that we'll do over the next year or so. Did you say, how many mission areas did you look across? Like how oh, uh, how many? 15 yeah, different mission areas. So and across those different mission areas, and we are identifying how each service, you know, it's everything from uh, doing a non-combatant evacuate operations to uh, anti-submarine warfare to assault operations, everything, and figure out what each uh, element of the joint warfighting force would want to use, and looking at you know what the environment is that we operate in in the 2030 and beyond, and that was that was highly informative work because there's not there was not a lot of effort looking at how does the joint warfighting force with vertical lift fight in that 2030 and beyond. And uh, as you'll see later when those become manifested as KPPs and KSAs, that they're informed by that process. But is there a combined element to that as well, an allied fighting with partner nations component of that, of, of your analysis effort as well? Most of what we've looked at now is, is interoperability in the joint uh, okay. warfighting uh, yes. force context. Uh, thank you all very much thank for coming. You. Really appreciate the time. As I mentioned, this is um, we because of the complexity of the overall effort. Uh, we've had some discussions with them about uh, continuing to have conversations about more detailed aspects of FEL. Um, so there will be more in this regard. Uh, 8:30 on 1 July, we will have our uh, JMR specific event, and hope to see you then. And again, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks to all of you very much. Thank you. Thanks.